I quickly got on Joyce Meyer's website last night to make sure I could find a good sermon. <laughs> I like her better than Joel Olstein because I think she's more manly than he is. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? I guess you have Hillsong here, but they're going through a mess, aren't they? Yes. What do you, man? That's that's to be expected. Right. To be expected. Exodus nine. So I remember, man, I've gone back many, many years. This, this church I've preached at, it's probably the third most of any church. Of course, the two I pastor. And then this one's the third one. And I remember being downtown. And I walked in and Brother Ray with big eyes said, you're going to preach for us this morning, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> And so I've watched uh, from a distance your church. It's been a real blessing all these years. So Exodus 9, um, Brother Jason asked me to go through this one this morning, and hopefully this will give you an understanding. Exodus 9, uh, you can see that it's dealing with uh, the plagues. <clears throat> and in verse 20 and 21, gives uh, two basic attitudes that everybody in the world has toward the words of God. Okay, Th these are the two basic attitudes. And when you run down through it, picking up about uh, verse 18 and following, you can see this is the plague where hailstones were going to come down and anybody, any of the cattle that were outside of the buildings were going to be destroyed. And this is where a common saying originates. It says, until the cows come home. Now, I don't know if you have that here in our culture, but it is in ours. Until the cows come home. And many of your common sayings come from the Bible. Amen. And it doesn't matter the upbringing of people. It's just, it just comes out. And uh, often when I hear those, I use those as an opportunity to witness. And they're shocked because they just said a Bible phrase. Right. And then I show them in the Bible where it is. And that makes the Bible so common. It's a fascinating book. I mean, who would put a book together in the first books called Genesis? In the beginning, Genesis. Oh, I'm going to start a book. In the beginning. I'm going to start with the beginning of Genesis. And that's what he did. It's so simple but so profound. Amen. So he starts in paradise, and the last five words in, in Genesis is in a coffin in Egypt. You start off in paradise, you go down here. And so Exodus is how to exit out of that world. Amen. So 920, he that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses, okay, until the cows come home. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. Okay, so those are the two basic attitudes. Fear, and fear is the right word. Fear. The words of God, we ought to tremble when we discover our beliefs or behavior are contrary to the Bible. Right. Amen. That's good. So fear, it's not reverential trust, it's fear. Amen. And the other one is disregard. Disregard. Now, the disregarding has a big variation. Okay, Proverbs 13, 13 says... Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. There's that fear again. Right. Okay, and so disregarding the Bible, and then it varies to despising the Bible. So that's a pretty big thing, but this is everybody in the world. Okay, one party fears what the word says, and when, especially if our behavior beliefs is contrary, and the other party either disregards, ignores, doesn't consider it, or they're fanatical against it. They despise it. They hate it. So that's the variation. Okay, and uh, like I said, fear is the right word. In Isaiah 66, verse 2 and 5, it mentions the certain people that God looks to, towards, like they become the apple of his eye. Wouldn't you like to be the apple of his eye? Amen. That's, a, that's a Bible phrase. Right. And uh, if, if someone says, we don't see eye to eye, show them in Isaiah where that's found. 
Okay, and so um, if you want to be the apple of God's eye, Isaiah 66, 2 and 5 states that he looks at those who tremble at his words. So that's fear. The man who demonstrated it is Ezra in Ezra 9, verse 4, where he sat down a stone and he pulled his own hair out because of the behavior of Israel. So he's demonstrating what it means to fear the word of the Lord. Psalm 119, verse 120, probably is the complete definition of what it means to fear the Lord. Psalm 119, got 176 verses. In verse 120, it reads, um, My flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgments. Man, you can't get more clear than that, can you? I was raised on a farm, and I'm a farm boy through and through. <clears throat> and uh, my motto is never use a big word when a small word will do. Amen. And uh, so you don't need a dictionary to understand me, that's for sure. So uh, the, I want to give you some of the differences, uh, the basic differences between what are called fundamentalists and Bible believers. Amen. Okay, fundamental, and it, it, it is a variation. It's a big variation. And I'm not saying, so let's say the fundamental Baptist word. I'm not saying they're bad people. Right. It's a difference between gold coin and silver coin. If somebody had an ounce of gold coin and an ounce of silver coin, what are you going to grab? <laughs> Okay, so that's the basic difference. Uh, and so we're going to run some things. A Bible believer believes all of the words. Amen. Doesn't mean that he applies all of the words as far as you've got to rightly divide the doctrine. He believes all of them. And the fundamental Baptist will usually refer to a Bible believer as a cultist. Right. You'll find that in uh, Acts 24, 14. They called the way I believe heresy, I believe all that the prophets have spoken. So when a fundamental Baptist refers to our church as a cult, I take that as a badge of honor. Thank you for that compliment. Amen. Okay, and again, it's, people have a certain mindset and how they're raised. And so hopefully a Bible believer is someone who will change their beliefs to match the Bible. But everybody else want to look in the Bible to change the words to make it say what they want it to say. Okay, so that's, that's the basic idea. In a fundamentalist church, okay, let me define the word fundamentalist. I, I see all, let's use the word religion between a Bible believer and a fundamentalist. I used to hate it when the media would call the Muslims the Muslim fundamentalists. I hated that, used to hate that, when I was a fundamentalist. And then when I realized, yes, they are. Right. So a fundamentalist in sports, uh, being raised on a farm in Indiana, Indiana is known for basketball, and any sport, there's a fundamental aspects of the sport. Okay, the good players must know and practice the fundamentals of that sport. The great players can on occasion step outside of the fundamentals in order to do what they need to do to win the game. Okay, so the fundamentals are good. Okay, so uh, you have fundamental Muslims. That's the five pillars of the Muslim faith, five pillars. Okay, and then you have fundamental Calvinist. They have five, the tulip, the five points of Calvinism. Fundamental Pentecostals. Fundamental Lutherans. Fundamental Catholics. The Catholics would be like their sacraments. And if you would attend any of these uh, organizations, you're going to hear all that they're going to give you in anywhere from three to six months. You're going to hear it all. Yep. In three to six months, and it's just going to be a rehash over and over and over. In the fundamental Baptist world, depending on which camp, it might be busing, it might be knocking on doors, soul winning, it might be something. But even in those groups, you're going to hear basically this building baptisms and tithing. Okay, that's basically what they're going to preach on. Come to church, do this, you know, bring somebody with you, blah, blah, blah. And those are good things. 
But you need something to sink your teeth in sometimes. Amen. 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 Okay, and so uh, people who stay in the fundamental Baptist, because if a, somebody has a big church in the fundamental Baptist world, obviously you have to have organization, you have to have people who know how to work and have some duty to stay with it. And the amazing thing is that they stay so busy that they don't have time to study the Word. Right. And they're starving to death spiritually, but their character and their duty allows them to keep moving forward, which is impressive. But you would, there's just so much more to it. Amen. Okay, there's so much more to the scriptures. The Bible is just fascinating. It's an amazing book. Uh, the more I read it, it, I feel like, man, I'm feeling less and less like I understand it. There's so many details. The God of the Bible is so infinite in his wisdom and understanding. Amen. Who are we? You know, and so in, in my world, in uh, my fundamental Baptist world I grew up in, I was born into a Calvinist family. Okay, you cannot choose to be a Calvinist. You have to be born into it. <laughs> right. And so I, I discovered that I was predestinated not to be a Calvinist. Amen. And so uh, praise the Lord for that. Amen. And that's a stumper. If you want a, the zinger, you know, if you talk to a Calvinist, just say, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have a choice in the matter. I was predestinated before the foundation of the world not to be a Calvinist. And I'm not an Armenian because I reject that of my free will. Amen. Amen. You got it covered. End of argument. Done. Over with. And so I, I came around to these primitive Baptist ladies and I asked her, I, I knew the primitive Baptist, which is hard shell Baptist, and I asked her when she got put in Christ. Well, she said before the foundation of the world. I looked at her and I said, you don't look that old. Yeah, that's right. I mean, she was probably in her late 70s, but she certainly wasn't almost 6,000 years old. And it never dawned on her until I said that to her, just to make her think about that. So I was raised in a, in a, a Dutch Reformed, uh, and, and then I was, a, I, my, I think my dad and I got saved in a similar time span. I was very young, nine years old. And, uh, and then my dad would go to the Domini, that's what we'd call the pastor, about evangelizing. And he said, if you want to do that, go start your, do your own thing. And um, so we became part of what back in the 60s was called non-denominational Bible churches. Okay, now today, you might find a rare one where the old guard is still standing guard, but most of them today are contemporary. This is before the new Bibles. This is before the contemporary. They did rightly divide. I remember seeing Clarence Larkin's Dispensational Truth book as a teenager. So back then, that was pretty decent. Uh, but then the second pastor we got was a Calvinist, and, and Dad tried to work with it. And when you, when you help, when your family, he had uh, several siblings, and when they put a building together and a church together, it's very difficult to leave when you can't deal with the pastor. So we left, became fundamental Baptists. And it's a whole new world, fundamental Baptist. So sort of the Lord, Hiles Anderson, rah, 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 all that stuff. And we were in that world for a while. And I started seeing some issues um, my wife and I attended Hiles Anderson College. We, am a bon bon we are bona fide gadgets from there. And so um, we were very naive, but we took the good that we could see and then discovered later the bad that was around us. Okay, shockingly bad. And I'll mention some of it in the morning service. So we took that, and then, I, and then I heard about this guy named Ruckman, and I thought, what is that? <laughs> and so that's what introduced me to the Bible-believing world, and I thought, that's what I've been looking for. Amen. And I've been on that high ever since. Yes, sir. And I've, I've noticed the, the differences between the fundamental Baptist world and the Bible believers where I can go to a fundamental Baptist church and get something out of it. But they certainly wouldn't darken the door of where I'm at. Right, right. 
Just want to do it. And, and I feel it, it, it's their loss. I can learn from anybody. Everybody can be my teacher, no matter who they are. Everybody knows something I don't know. And so, hence, they could be my teacher. It doesn't mean I have to be palsy palsies with them, but I can get something from them. And so I want to give you some of the basic differences. I, I do think that there are uh, fundamental Baptists. I'm going to kind of focus on the fundamental Baptists rather than fundamental Presbyterians, fundamental Lutherans, and all that stuff. Uh, my, dad had, <clears throat> my dad and I were at a farm auction, and I, he and I had witnessed to a, a man, and he, he made a profession of faith at the auction. And dad went to witness to his wife, and she said, She's Presbyterian. She said, uh, I can't do anything about it. I was prede I'm predestinated to go to hell. Can you imagine living like that? Predestinated to go to hell. Now, before our flight came, I, of my free will, bought a ticket. And before I got in a plane, I was predestinated, destination, to come to Australia. I wasn't in Australia when I was in Chicago. But of my free will, I bought the ticket, and then the destination was in it was the responsibility of the airline. Right. So uh, I do have some YouTube things where I go through predestination election, defining it. A very amazing thing is the devil takes Bible words and twists the definition. Right. Right. And so when you get the definition right according to Scripture, it's very easy to deal with. Things are so easy when we kind of boil it down. So I want to give you some five basic differences between, let's say, the fundamental Baptist world okay, versus a Bible believer. And it's, it's mainly an attitude more than anything that a person can have. The first one is this. One glorifies the words. One glorifies the words. The other, the other one promotes the fundamentals of their faith. And that's it. Three to six months, you're going to hear about all they're going to give you. Okay? One glorifies the words, and the other promotes this fundamentalist faith that they have. And if you stay in that ship and never ask questions, the, the sailing is pretty smooth. But when you begin to ask, what about this Hebrews? I don't understand this Hebrews 3 stuff. I don't get this Hebrews 4 and this Hebrews 10. I don't understand that James 2. Uh, can you help me? Oh, uh, don't worry about that, brother. Just don't worry about that. All the Bibles in the Baptist mode. And just don't worry about those things. Well, I am worried about it because I'm dealing with people that's asking me these questions and I can't answer them. I know they're wrong, but I, can't, I don't know what the answer is. A lot of things in life is you figure out what's wrong and then amazingly you get toward the right. I think that's how mechanics work. You fix the wrong and eventually something's right. So the fundamentals are the basic beliefs. Uh, they would refer to the verbally inspired original autographs, which they've never seen. They will add, subtract, change words to make the Bible fit into a fundamentalist world. Hebrews and James and all those other passages. And uh, they will, like in 2 Corinthians 2.17, it says, Paul said, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity in the sight of God speak we in Christ. So they corrupt the words of God. They will deny they're doing that. They'll run to Greek and Hebrew to change the definitions in English, which proves they're not Bible believers. Right. Right. Amen. A Bible believer will exalt the words, will point people to the book. Psalm 138, verse 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple, Praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou, God, for thou hast magnified thy words above all thy name. Amen. <clears throat> now a person might say, well, that's Old Testament. Oh, yeah, right. Hey, good. I'm glad you got that figured out. Uh, how about the New Testament? 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 1 says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. Amen. 
Amen. Whoa, there we got something in the New Testament. Now, what's that free course thing mean? Free course. Now, I didn't understand what free course meant until I looked at my Black's Law Dictionary. And it's a legal term. You might be surprised all the legal terms found in the Bible. Paul might have been some sort of uh, a lawyer or attorney of his day. Might have been. At least he understood it. Free course is an admiralty term. It's a term in admiralty law. And it's, it's a term that's used in sailing. Okay, when you have a wind that's favorable toward your destination, you are sailing on free course. Do you see the analogy? A ship sailing with the wind. The wind is pushing it toward its destination. What is wind a picture of in the scriptures? The Spirit of God, the teacher. So the Spirit of God is pushing us, blowing us toward the likeness of Jesus Christ. Greatest prayer you could pray is 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 1. Pray that for anybody saved and lost. They need their eyes opened. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. We give credit to the word. We don't give credit to our education or scholarship. Amen. So that's what a Bible believer does. He will change his beliefs to match the Bible. Psalm, I, Jeremiah 36, there are certain uh, chapters in the Bible that are forbidden in certain fundamental circles. In Israel fundamentalism, they forbid Israeli people to read Isaiah 53. Don't read that one. And when the Ethiopian eunuch was in Jerusalem worshiping, he probably heard a rabbi say that. When somebody tells you don't read that one, what do you want to do? And that's what he did, is he read it and he got saved. Amen. Well, you won't hear a Bible college go through Jeremiah 36. I went through five years of Christian college, two in the contemporary world, three in the fundamental Baptist world. I went to the contemporary one for a real spiritual reason, is to play intercollegiate basketball, you know, real spiritual. And then transferred to the Bible believer in one, or the fundamentalist world. And I've never heard, I never heard him preach on Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah 36. Won't touch it. It's about the preservation of the words of God. Amen. They'll stay away from that like a pork burger on bar mitzvah. Okay, the second one, the second major uh, difference is one magnifies doctrine and the other insists upon devotion. <clears throat> Now, devotion, let's, let's stretch that out. Devotion means looking at the Bible spiritually, instructionally, practically. Okay, looking at the Bible doctrinally is looking at it from God's perspective down. Looking at the Bible for instruction is looking from our perspective up. We get benefits out of instruction. God gets the blessings out of the doctrine. Okay, we can be a blessing to God by believing the doctrine. Okay, and God is a blessing to us when we believe the instruction. How many spies went to the land of Canaan? Twelve, twelve of them. All twelve obeyed the instructions to believe the doctrine. Right. Joshua and Caleb believed the doctrine that they were going to get this land. All twelve obeyed the instruction, though. But only two went into the land of Canaan. Doctrine and devotion, okay? You can approach the Bible instructionally, all the Bible. Okay, you can go from Genesis to Concordance or Revelation, all the way through instructionally, motivationally, doctrinally, practically. But when you get to the doctrine, you have to see, okay, Israel, that's different. The church is different. Gentiles, this is different. This is a different setting here. This is a different setting here. And you got to look at that, different settings, and the Bible will pop off the page when you see Amen. the doctrine. Amen. I mean, it'll just jump right off the page. Right. It's fascinating. It's a fascinating. It's un interesting. If you look at James chapter 2, it's the only time you find the word gay in the Bible. James 2, when you get to the back of the Bible, you're getting to the back of history. So here, almost 2,000 years ago, James threw in the word gay that somebody is going to use that term and they're going to be in a pretty raunchy environment and they're not gay. That's right. They're miserable. That's right. Amen. 
Gay means cheerful, means happy. And here in James 2, and you can play on that. You know, I, I was just telling Brother Tim that I was, we were in Purdue, and this kid walking beside me. I'm going to the corner to hold my sign, and I offered him a gospel track, and he wouldn't take it. And he says, well, I said, why won't you take my track? Consider the Lord Jesus. He said, well, I just came from the gay fest. I said, oh, okay, I'm happy too. <laughs> I said, if you believe this, it'll make you more happy. Amen. He said, well, you don't understand. I said, what? I just went to the gay fest. Well, gay means happy. I'm happy. I'm a very happy person because of Jesus Christ. Please, would you consider the Lord? And he, he, what I was trying to get him to do is tell me what he really was considering. But that would have blew his cover. I could see his eye. His conscience was killing him. And that's what I wanted. You see, they take a good word and ruin it. Amen. And James prophesied that in James chapter 2. If you look at the Bible doctrinally, if you don't, you miss the whole idea. He says in 1 Timothy 4 verse 6, he said, Take heed. The entire chapter is about deception. He says, Take heed unto thyself and unto thy doctrine. And doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them they hear thee. Not save thyself salvation, save thyself from deception. Amen. And that's a doctrine. The first time the word doctrine is found in the Bible is in Deuteronomy 32. It's the, one, it's the, the first part of the lyrics of the Song of Moses. Doctrine is like the rain which shall distill as the dew. That's the doctrines of God. Doctrine, like a doctor or a doctorate in the education world, is the highest level of education, attainment, okay? And so the doctrine would be the highest level of beliefs the scriptures give. It's God's perspective of things. When you look at the doctrine, and I know a person can be so doctrinally sound, they're dry as a cracker. So that's why the scriptures were given for two basic reasons, for doctrine and instruction. Amen. Both of those will reprove us and correct us. Amen. So we look at the Bible both ways, from God's perspective, from our perspective. And that's what will help us understand the Bible. The way you obey doctrine is you believe it. Amen. The way you obey the gospel is you believe it. The way you obey the instructions is you obviously obey them. Like I said, the 12 spies, all 12, obeyed the instructions, but two believed the doctrinal promise. And when you get into the Bible, the doctrines of God are eternal. There are many strange, very strange things in the scriptures. Supernatural. We don't consider the supernatural world. You know, right beside us is an invisible world. We don't see it. They see us. And I think the angels have a joke amongst themselves. So first, when they step through that invisible veil into the physical, what is it, what's the first thing they say? Be not afraid. Oh, man, that's easy for you to say. You just jumped from there to here. We can't see you. Be not afraid. Oh, man, my heart's killing me. And if we could see that invisible world right beside, we might be shocked. I know we'd be shocked. And there are some supernatural things in the Bible that are just fascinating. Thank you much. And so uh, the, as far as doctrine goes in the Bible, in, in Hebrews 13.9, it mentions that uh, strong meat would be strange doctrines. There are very strange doctrines in the Bible. I'm not going to get into them. Uh, weird stuff. You get into kind of the conspiracies and stuff like that. And uh, so uh, we've had people, you know, come to Christ by studying the conspiracies. And it, uh, one guy, it dawned on him after studying all the conspiracies, he said, what about the Bible? Yeah. And that's how he came to Christ. Amen. He discovered that. So we keep things in priority, though. We're not going to go around and, you know, UFOs, you know, all this stuff, you know. Uh, we see that it is in Scripture, and we can discuss it with a person that's had weird experiences. Maybe you come across a Satanist. Weird experiences. And there's a gentleman here in, in Australia, the last time we were here, you know, we're talking to him, and weird stuff. 
Thank God I've been sheltered from it. Amen. But there's people that had some very strange experiences. And then we discover, oh, the Bible covers this. And we can help them. You see, the larger the island of knowledge, the longer the shoreline of wonder. See, and that's why the older you get, the more mellow we get, is because we get unsure of ourselves because of all the wonder that's around us. Okay, the, the third basic difference, where's a clock around here? I want to make sure. Brother, you take your time. You've got about 40 minutes still. You'd be fibbing. Well, <laughs> 23 minutes till 1030. Okay. But you still got to sleep. Go to, go to 45 okay. hours you want. No, no, I, I'll... Love it. I'm, uh, yeah. <laughs> the mind can only retain what the bottom can sustain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have pattern pews. Yeah. Okay, so the third basic difference is one desires to obey the first commandment. What is that? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. The other strives to enforce the second commandment. Now, we're not opposed to those things, but we keep them in priority. One desires to obey the first commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength and mind. The other strives. They have to strive to enforce the second commandment, get everybody involved in the second commandment. Okay, now here's the idea of it. When you switch them, the second over the first, we put man in priority over God. Right. And hence you have this philosophy is as a Christian, oh, it's a Christian, you shouldn't offend anybody. Yeah. You're right. I don't want to offend my God. Amen. Amen. First and foremost, I don't want to offend my God. Now, if me obeying my God offends my fellow man, deal with it. They say, you offended me. I would say, you have a right to be offended, and I have a right not to care. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and see, now, it, what used to be tolerance is you have to promote them. It used to be you have to tolerate me. Now, you have to promote me and pay my way. And that's when I say, c'est la vie, I'm out of here. Why do you need my approval? You must be feeling guilty. If you need my approval, you must be feeling guilty. And you're asking me to do something that I'm not willing to do. Because it would be an offense to my God. Philippians chapter 1 verse 10. We ought to live our lives seeking not to offend our God. If that offends our fellow man, I'm sorry about that. And I'm not purposely trying to offend somebody, but that's just the way it goes. I mean, it's getting so crazy, you can't say anything to anybody now, do you? Hi, how are you doing today? What do you mean by that? <laughs> yeah. I meant, hi, how are you doing? <laughs> I mean, what do you think I meant? Well, I think you're insulting me. Well, if you want me to insult you, I can do that too. Philippians 1.10, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Amen. You see, the Lord said something to the Pharisees in Matthew 15. They were sitting down and eating, and then the apostles said, did you know you offended them? Yeah, let them alone. To blind lead to blind, both fall in a ditch. Right. <laughs> That's the Lord's reaction. Yes. If they can't handle the truth, tough. Okay, and that doesn't mean you, you, know, you speak the truth harshly to folks, but you know, many soul winning methods make the soul winner the hero. They're rescuing them from a mean God. God will not compromise to win a soul. Amen. His number one attribute is His holiness. Right, amen. And a person, and when God tells a sinner to go to hell, he is absolutely right in doing it. Okay, and we need, I would dare say our approach in witnessing to people is that you could honor Jesus Christ by accepting his payment. Amen. You could honor him. 
I mean, would you want to be an individual that a person accepts your friendship because you saved him from fire? I mean, that's one thing. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing. But wouldn't it be nice if they accepted you for who you are? I mean, it goes both ways. It goes all ways, you know, and the Lord has different methods of winning people to Christ and bringing him to, and he knows exactly what needs to be said to the person at the right time with the right spirit. And I think that's what we need to pray. God, please give me the right words at the right time to the right person with the right spirit. And you might be surprised what it takes for some people. Most of the time, we ought to be gentle as a lamb. But then sometimes we season our grace with a little salt. Most, most of them just hit them with the salt. And then they walk up and say, oh, I have suffered for Jesus. No, you're an idiot. Yeah, you know, and the thing is, is we are, our desire is to obey the first commandment. And the other strives to enforce the second commandment. Okay, we're not opposed to the second commandment. We ought to be doing these things, but we make sure our priorities in the right way. The third one might help focus on that again. I'm sorry, the fourth one. Okay, one focuses on the primary ministry, and the other demands the secondary ministry. Okay, pop quiz. What epistle in Paul's writings deals with the ministry? You'll find it all through there, ministry, ministry, all through 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is what we'll look at first. What is the primary ministry? 2 Corinthians 4 verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry... As we have received mercy, we faint not. What ministry? Well, when you see the word therefore, you've got to look in front of it to see what it's there for. And so if you back up to verse 17 of chapter 3, Now the Lord is that spirit, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, in the intellectual world, they call that an open mind. Okay, open mind. In the intellectual world, they're some of the most closed-minded people you ever meet. Right, right. You get around a college campus, pass out gospel tracts, and if somebody sticks their nose up in the air, that's probably a professor. Yeah. Closed-minded. I thought you people were open-minded. And I throw that out at them. I thought you people were open-minded. You know, I offered a guy a gospel track once. And he said, oh, no, thank you. I said, I thought you, don't you, shouldn't you be open-minded? Oh, yeah, yeah, you got to be open-minded. Yeah, no, I'm open-minded. And I offered him a gospel track again. No, no, no. I said, you know, you don't look like a bigot to me. Uh, yeah. He wouldn't take track. What was he? He was a bigot. Would not consider the Lord Jesus Christ. And so um, in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, we with open face, beholding as in a glass. Okay, we call that a mirror sometimes. The glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So as you and I are looking in the Scriptures, it's looking back at us. Amen. And the reflection is Jesus Christ. Amen. And the more we look in it with an open heart, then that reflection will come back to us. Now, if that sound, what I just gave you, drop down to 4.2... But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We aim at the conscience. First time the word conscience is found in the Bible is with that woman taking adultery in the very act, John 8, 9. And guess what all the new Bibles do with that passage? Out. They don't like the idea of your conscience. It's an amazing thing. It's something that God has put in our DNA, your conscience. We have chickens in our property, and I have yet, I have never had to hire a chicken psychologist <laughs> because the rooster is favoring these hens over this hen. They don't get upset with adultery in the chicken world. 
And when a chicken dies, they don't have a funeral. They don't call the chicken ambulance to come and get it. They step over it. How you know that we're different than animals is that if there's a dead animal on the side of the road, roadkill, nobody calls the authorities, but there's a person. Somebody should call the authorities. You know what the difference is between a dead deer on the side of the road and a dead lawyer on the side of the road? Is skid marks in front of the deer. <laughs> and so you got to think on that one for a while. <laughs> And so your primary ministry is you personally getting in this book and trying to get our attitude and mind like the Lord's. An outflow of that would be a secondary ministry in chapter 5. This is the secondary ministry, chapter 5, verse 18. Where it says, and all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And then down in verse 20, we're ambassadors. What is that? That is, if your primary ministry of your joy that you have of being in the word of God is such a joy to you, you want somebody else to experience that joy. Amen. And so then you tell them about the Lord or whatnot. And try to get them to come to the Lord that way. So they can experience that same joy. You see, the first one is your walk. The second one is your work. And a lot of marriages fail because they stopped walking with each other. And worked and got so busy they forgot to go out on a date. And enjoy each other's presence. So now there's a perfect illustration of this is in Luke chapter 10. If you, if you want to take a look at that. Luke 10, the last five verses. Uh, Jesus is in uh, the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. His three siblings. Can you imagine their parents reading in the scriptures about their children? Wouldn't they be so blessed to see that? Three siblings, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And they were in a house and and Martha was busy making, you know, something, some Jewish dish or something like that, get, trying to feed po folks in the house. And Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him speak. And like sisters often do, where Martha says, Jesus, she ain't helping. You know, if I put it together, she ought to wash the dishes. And Jesus said, Martha... Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. That's a seven times in the Bible where you have that first and the name said twice in a row. That's like first and middle name. When mom says first and middle name, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but there are seven times in the Bible where it's Abraham, Abraham, Moses, Moses, Simon, Simon. And one of them is this lady, Martha. He said, Martha, Martha, thou art troubled about many things. What Mary has chosen shall not be taken away from her. Implying that Martha's service can be taken away. Mary sat. Mary was a student. Martha was a servant. Martha wasn't a bad lady. Right. Gotta have servants. Amen. But at that time, she should have just put the, the food to the side and sat right beside Mary, her sister. Amen. She was a student. She was a learner. And the thing about Mary is that Mary's service is recorded three times in the Bible when she anointed the feet of Jesus. The amazing thing is that Mary did the right thing at the right time because in a Jewish culture... In the Passover, they would choose a lamb on the 10th day of the first month. And it's funny how that's written amazingly in Exodus 12. It says, choose a lamb. And then the next verse says, the lamb. And the next verse says, your lamb. They set it aside on the 10th day of the month, and it's like anointed, it's sanctified. And then on the 14th day, it's sacrificed. On the 10th day of that month, Mary anointed Jesus Christ for his burial. 
The ladies that came after the fact were doing the right thing at the wrong time, but still the Lord's going to accept it. But everything is beautiful in His time. Timing is everything. Amen. Anybody that knows to work on an engine, timing is everything. If it's out of time, it's going to run rough. It jumps time. The only way it's running is somebody's pushing it from the back. Timing is everything with the Lord. Mary's service was given in Matthew 26, Mark 14, John 12, three out of the four Gospels where she served Jesus Christ. And how could she do that? She had spent time studying, listening to Jesus Christ, understanding Jewish doctrine, and she did the right thing at the right time. And God honored for that. And in fact, during the gospel of the kingdom, it's going to be meant as a memorial to her. Right. Fascinating. It's an amazing thing. Hers was a labor of love. Amen. See, make a joyful noise and serve the Lord with gladness. gladness. That's what the joy will do for us. You see, how do we know why this is priority? Well, when uh, you were in solitary confinement, lockdowns, how could you work for the Lord? People wouldn't talk to you. You know, we'd be at, a, you know, Purdue before this, not before, America wasn't as bad as here, but we'd be at Purdue and we wouldn't be wearing masks, you know. And all these colleges, I thought you kids were thinking. And they wouldn't take our gospel. Huh? You don't get a mask on. Right. <laughs> I'm healthy. Amen. Okay, but it really stymied work for God. Did we walk with God during that time? You see, and so uh, Richard Wormbron spent three years in solitary confinement. How did he work for God? He couldn't. Right. But he could worship God. Amen. But it would have been tough. I'm not taking that lightly at all. So one focused on the primary, the other focused on the secondary ministry. The last difference, basically, is one exalts a second coming, and the other declares first coming only. I went three, three years of Howells Anderson College. I never heard a message on the second coming of Christ. Three years. Most important doctrine of the Bible. Second, I, now I realize we get in the program because of the first coming. But how many parents, if, if you experience an unfortunate death of a child, I don't think you're going to mark your calendar that death day and honor that day. You're going to weep. You're going to cry. There's a God in heaven. There's going to be a day where his son is glorified. Amen. His son is going to be awarded the blue ribbon and the trophy and this. Amen. And there's a God in heaven that's looking forward to that day. Amen. That's the big day on God's calendar. The big day on our calendar is the first coming because that's when salvation was paid. But the great promise is of the crown of rejoicing or the crown of righteousness that's given in 2 Timothy 4. It says that we love his appearing. But you see how subtle it is? When things get bad, do we pray for the rapture more? Is it because we love his appearing or we really want our disappearing? That's really how subtle it is. Sure, man, I'd like to get out of this mess. And you see, for the believer, the rapture is going to solve every problem you've ever had. And for the unbeliever, it's just starting. And now I, I'm amazed at how these trolls on YouTube will really get upset with the pre-tribulation rapture. And I, I actually kind of do videos, again, just for the fun of it, just to watch the trolls. And I tell them, have a good time. I'm going to be gone. Amen. Amen. And then I'll tell them, have you bought a house in Jordan? Have you had some supplies built up in Jordan? Are you getting ready to run down to Petra? And they say, what are you talking about? I didn't think you knew. It's all about Israel. It's all about Jerusalem. It's got nothing to do with the church. Man, we're out of here. That's right. Amen. I mean, that's the big day. The big day on God's calendar is the second coming. It's the main doctrine of the entire Word of God. Back in 1999, there were some um, misguided Catholics 
that wanted to force the second coming. So they pretended to take, well, I know they're pretending, some DNA off of the Shroud of Turin. It was going to implant it in a virgin in the spring of 1999 to give birth to Jesus in 2000. And their website was called clonejesus.com. And they were trying to force the second coming. Obviously, the website's been shut down. I did uh, copy some of the papers to prove that it was in existence at one time. And what are they doing? They're just hoodwinked. They're deceived. But one exalts the second coming of Christ. The other declares the first coming of Christ. And here's the amazing thing about it. If you would, one place, Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Again, uh, you know, I, there's been times that I, I'll go back and listen to a, a preaching from the days uh, that I needed it, uh, as far as Hiles Anderson, and, fun, and, and I listen to that, and I say, wow, did that satisfy? I must have been pretty anemic. <laughs> um, but here's the amazing thing about the Lord. In Matthew 23, okay, this is mean-spirited chapter, oh boy. Matthew 23, Jeremiah 22, the meanest chapters in the Bible. Jesus and Jeremiah are railing on religious leaders. I mean, just nailing them. And I'm sure they were offended after this. And in Matthew 23, he said this, this Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Okay, now, real quick here. Remember, we forget the supernatural. Who are these people or beings? Pharisees. Jesus called them the children of Satan. Was that literal? Jesus called them vipers, as in the serpent of Genesis 3. John the Baptist called them vipers. Was that literal? One of the apostles, he said, have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil. He didn't say you're like a devil, he's a devil. A supernatural creature that wasn't a flesh and blood individual who can shape shift to appear to be man so good that for three and a half years the apostles didn't know that that wasn't a normal being. Those Pharisees were walking, talking devils right. who can appear to be man. And here's what Jesus said about them. 23.3 All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe that observe and do. We can pick up the truth from any fundamentals. And if it matches scripture, good to go. And then he says, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. So we can pick up the truth and pull it out because we're living in a day and age where the wheat and the tares have inter interwoven. And this is part of Jesus' program to prove sincerity. Where you got to hear all these tares. Oh, right, there's, there's a seed I can pull out and keep that. Oh, there's another one I can get right out of there. And keep that with scripture. The Lord is telling us that we can learn. We can learn truth from anybody. Fundamental Baptists. And we can have grace toward them. Amen. And we should have grace. We should have grace toward them all. Okay. Uh, but yet, personally, I want more. Yeah, me too. I want more to it. Amen. I want, I want to sink my teeth in some of that heavier stuff in the scriptures. On occasion, but not... You know, I'm not going to be in a street corner, you know, telling a guy about that unless they bring it up. And then we'll talk about, you know, flat earth or something like that. <laughs> if they bring it up, I've had three, I've had three uh, emails from people that came to Christ starting with that issue. They came to the Lord and realized, oh man, there's something going on. And if people don't uh, uh, believe that, fine, I don't care. Right. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ is supreme. Amen. I would rather know my English and go to heaven and speak Greek and Hebrew and go to hell. Yeah. Amen. 
any day. So these are some of the subtle differences. I hope this was a help to you. Let's pray. Lord, I do pray to ask you to help us to understand your words, help us to be students of your word. We thank